If you have your Bibles, let's turn together to Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and, they, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Lord, again we come before you, and we stand humbly before your word. Lord, use it now to change our lives. Use it now through the power of your spirit to transform us into the image of your son. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Now last week we started in verse 6 of chapter 3. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 3 tells us that the Pharisees and the Herodians came together and they, plot, and they were plotting to kill Jesus. And we started there because that set the tone, that set the context for everything that was happening in our passage for last week because it was their attempt you know, they're questioning and they're following him. It was their attempt to, quote, legally put Jesus to death for violating the Sabbath, for doing what they thought was not legal on the Sabbath. Uh, because the disciples crushed grain together in their hands, they had to kill him. Because he healed a man in the synagogue on the Sabbath, they wanted to murder him. They, who were protecting the Sabbath so that good could be done, were plotting to do evil on the Sabbath. So that verse shadowed over everything that we talked about last week and it continues in to this week. Verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed him. Now some of the commentaries say that Jesus goes to the sea to get away from the Pharisees because they are trying to kill him, which is a fair statement. Others say that he's going there to get away from the crowds because you know, he, he's got to have some time to himself. It seems to me you can't say which one is which. So maybe it's both. Maybe it's both. You know, he's trying to put some distance between himself and the Pharisees and to get a break from the crowd, uh, a day at the beach, if you will. You know, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, but whatever the reason, it just didn't work out, did it? It did not work out at all. It said a great multitude from Galilee followed him from Judea, from Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, Tyre, Sidon, a great multitude. When they heard everything that he was doing, they followed him. In other words, they were coming from the north, from the south, and from the east, and from the west. Jew and Gentile alike were coming to him. And it wasn't just, you know, a walk across, you know, town, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Some people were traveling one and two weeks. That's how far away some of these places are to get there by foot or, uh, or horseback or, or camelback, I guess, <laughs> in, this, in this case, uh, just how far it was. It'd be like you and I getting a car and driving to the West Coast. You know, it's going to take you a while. That's how far they were coming. And the overwhelming desire of the crowds was not to hear the message of Jesus. That wasn't why they were coming. They were coming for his healing touch for his healing touch. They were seeking to be relieved from their pain, relieved from their suffering. In other words, they were more concerned for their bodies than they were for their souls. You and I are a lot like the crowd, aren't we? 
our prayer requests tend to focus on the physical problems of people, uh, our problems and the problems of those we love. Now, of course, God made us uh, with these bodies. And throughout Scripture, we see that God is deeply concerned with the well-being of our bodies. In fact, one day, the Scriptures tell us that we will be transformed. Our bodies will be changed, and they will be eternally healed. And we will be reunited with our soul. So it's a good thing. I don't mean to say that it's a bad thing to be concerned about the health of our body. However, we're more than just this body, aren't we? This body is, is only a house at this point for our soul. And Jesus made the care of our souls his top priority. What did he say? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, we need to be in much prayer for the well-being of our souls as well as our bodies. We need to pray for the souls of those we love as much or more than we pray for the bodies, the health of those that we love. Do you do that? Do I do that? Do, do we pray for the souls of our loved ones, for the souls of our neighbors, the souls of our friends that might not know Christ? Is there a burden on your heart for others to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you pray for their souls? And often I have, I have to admit that I fail on this, on this uh, front, that I do not do as, as well as I should. So let's pray. Let's come together to pray for the lost in our community, to pray for the lost that we, that, uh, at work or in our neighborhood. Let's have a burden for the souls of others. Now Jesus is clearly here concerned about the size of the crowd. He tells his disciples to get a boat and to keep it ready because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many had afflictions, pressed him to touch him. They're going to run him over. They're going to crush him. They want to be healed so badly. The crowd's desire for healing for their bodies is so great, they're going to trample Jesus. They long to touch him that they might be healed. And the crowd is a paradox of sorts. Its needs command the attention of Jesus, which Jesus in his compassion and in his mercy, gladly meets. But it's clear that the response of the crowd isn't one of faith. The crowd comes to Jesus not to fall down before him to seek forgiveness for their sins, but to fall upon him, if you will, to get what they want. Sounds a lot like the 21st century to me. You know, they, people see Jesus as a means to an end. You know, the preacher says, follow Jesus and his life principles and you'll be happy, healthy, and wealthy. Here's five steps to be a better parent, three steps to have a better marriage, and all of these things, and they come after Jesus for those things, and they fall upon him for what they can gain instead of falling down before him to find salvation, to find forgiveness of their sins. Now we have to ask ourselves, I have to ask myself, why are we with Christ? Why are we following Christ? Is it for what we think he can give, that, give to us? Or are we following him out of grace and love and thanksgiving for what he has done for us? To put it another way, are we living for ourselves and for our desires? Or are we living for the gospel? Are we living for self? Or are we living for Jesus Christ? Jesus will say a little, on, a little later on in this gospel, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, your agenda isn't important. You have to die to yourself and die to your agenda if you're going to follow Christ. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake, and for what? The sake of the gospel. will save it. That's who we are. That's what we're called to be are messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Next we see 
that while the crowds fall on Jesus, the demons fall down before Jesus, don't they? They uh, say who he is, and Jesus silences them. He silences them because it's not time for them to go forward and their, his name to go out that quickly. He silences them because their profession of faith is a false profession. And we see here also, I think, a foreshadowing of the final conflict between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of hell. Whenever evil appears before God, its mouth is shut. Scriptures tell us that when sinful people appear before God, they put their hand over their mouth in his presence and they keep silent. And no sinner has anything to say in the presence of God. And this business of people saying, well, when I get before God in heaven, I've got a, one or two questions for him. Really? Do you really? You, the created one, are going to tell your creator and question him. Job did that, didn't he? Didn't Job say that? You know, let me question him. I'll do this, I'll do that. And then God comes to before Job and, and the whirlwind and says, where were you? Uh, when I laid the foundations of the earth, where were you when the store, uh, stores for the snow and the, and the hail were set up? Where were you? And what does Job say? Behold, I am a small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Jesus finally escapes the crowds, though. He goes to the mountains. That's the next part. He goes to the mountains. If you want to, there's a couple of scenes. A scene by the sea and now a scene in the mountains. And he goes up to the mountain and he calls to him those he, uh, he himself wanted. Calls those who he wanted. And it says they came to him, that he appointed 12, that, he might be, that they might be with him, and that the, he might send them out to preach and to have power over sickness and to cast out demons. That's verses 13 through 15. Now, high school students these days, when they want to go to a college, what do you do? You, you send in your application with your application fee, and you have all of those, uh, your extracurricular activities or whatever on there, and you hope that you'll get accepted to that school. Well, in Jesus' day, that's how you got to be with a rabbi, a traveling rabbi, and that's how Jesus was seen as a traveling teacher, a traveling rabbi. And if you wanted to study with a particular rabbi, you sent in your application and you waited for an answer. Jesus turned that on its head. Jesus went out and he selected disciples. It's radically different from the custom of the day. He didn't take applications. He recruited the people he wanted to tutor. Mark tells us that Jesus called to him those he himself wanted. No application fee, no concern over GPA, you know, extracurricular activities. Oh, I fished a little bit and I worked for the Roman government. You know, that he wasn't concerned about that. And they didn't wait for a call or an email or a letter in the mail. Jesus called, he issued the call, and the call was to himself, and he issued the call to those who he wanted, and they came. They came. When Jesus calls, you come. You see, disciples don't decide to follow Jesus as if they're doing him a favor. You don't decide to follow Jesus and so, say, well, I've got all this good stuff. I can do some good for the church. No, you don't do that. Jesus' Jesus's call supersedes people, their will. His call is sovereign because everyone he calls to be a disciple here comes. And they came willingly to join this group of men and to be a part of Jesus. And when you come to Jesus' school, when you come to, I guess, uh, UJ, the University of Jesus, when you come there, there's only one course of study. You don't go to study the Old Testament or the Torah or the Talmud. You're, you are there to study Jesus. It says there that they come, that they might be with Jesus and that they might be sent out by Jesus. As you see, you don't go, we don't come to Jesus to see what we can make of ourselves. We don't come to see what we can make of ourselves with Jesus. Instead, we come and see what Jesus can make of us. 
Discipleship does not consist of what disciples can do for Christ, but in what Christ can make of his disciples. It's what he does in us. It is Christ who makes us. It is Christ who molds us. It is Christ who shapes us. He is the truth. He is the absolute truth. And I know the, the, word, the words absolute and truth in the same sentence here in the 21st century don't belong together. Well, there is an absolute truth. And there is, that truth is contained in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus molds us through his truth. He shapes us through that truth. Paul says, do not be conformed to the, this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that transformation is found in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. That is where the transformation is found. Next, verse 14. We see that Jesus appointed 12, that, he, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. It says, uh, the ESV says appoint. I think the King James says uh, ordained 12. Uh, and there is a two-fold purpose in this appointment or ordination as you see it, uh, to be with him and to be sent out to preach. To be with him, that phrase carries a lot of significance, I think. You think about it. The first thing Jesus calls these men to do is to be with him. Have you been with Jesus? Do you spend time with Jesus? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Are you spending time with him? You see, it, what this means is, is that being a disciple is a relationship before it is a task. Discipleship is a who before it is a what. From now on, the person and the work of Jesus Christ would determine the existence and the life of these 12 men. That's what it would do. That is the first purpose that we see there. And the second purpose Christ calls them to is that they're to be sent. They're sent out to preach. Uh, the phrase sent out is from the Greek word uh, apostolos. And it means to send or commission with a specific purpose. And we need to get our minds around this. Unless we think that he's talking, well, this, this is only for these 12 guys, that he's, Jesus is talking about some super followers of Jesus, apostles versus disciples. The literal word for apostle really only occurs one time in the Gospel of Mark, and that's in chapter 6, verse 30. But the word for disciple or disciples occurs over 45 times. So Mark is making a point, I think. And what's his point? He's saying that the call and the commission of the twelve is emblematic and representative of the call of every disciple, of every Christian. Every Christian is called to be with Jesus. Every Christian is called to first and foremost that relationship with Christ. The person and work of Christ, that relationship with Christ, determines everything about us. That's what he's saying here. His being, Christ, determines what every, the existence of every believer. If you're a teacher, your relationship with Christ determines what kind of teacher you're going to be. If you're a businessman, your relationship with Christ determines what kind of business, uh, how you run your business. If you're a, if you're a nurse, if you're a, an electrician or a plumber, or, or if you're retired, your relationship with Christ is the determining factor in how you live your life, how you work in your marriage, in your family, your entire life. That's what it's saying, that Christ holds first allegiance. And it also says here we're not only called to be with Jesus, you know, to sit around and navel gaze and come to church, say, oh, I'm with Jesus, this is great, and then go home and not do anything. No, there is ascending. We are to proclaim Christ. As the disciples of Jesus, we are to share the gospel. Well, I don't know what to say. Beth told you what to say. You know, that was, uh, you, people say that's a coincidence. You know, it's a God incidence. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in God. And God is at work here. And it is. The gospel's there. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. What did you do? You came from heaven to earth. You came here. That's basically what I have here. You came 
here to live among us, to live a perfect life, you know? And you walked among us. You lived that life. You were put to death on a cruel cross, and three days later, you rose, over the gra- rose from the grave. That's the song, isn't it? That's the song. You share about Jesus. I don't know what to say. Talk about Jesus. It's not about you. It's about him. Remember, they need to know that he's a real person. Tell, him, tell them about how God saves people. Tell them that he does it through his life, through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. That's the first thing people need to know. People don't need to know how you feel or how you think. They need to know what you've seen and what you've heard. What you've seen and what you've heard about Jesus Christ. And once they've heard about who Jesus is from the scripture, then maybe it's time to tell them a little bit about what Jesus has done for you. Because if you do that these days, well, Jesus did this for me and that for me. Well, Buddha does this for me. Allah does that for me. No, it's about Jesus Christ. Him first in your witness. Next we read in verse 13 that he gave them authority to cast out demons. Now, we have to be careful here because, you know, well, the preacher just said that this is all for us. Well, we got to be careful because if you read your Bible, there are very few people that had the authority to cast out demons. I, I personally think of the, is it the seven sons of Sceva that we find in, in Acts? I can't remember what chapter it is. I want to say chapter 7, but that might not be right. And they're going in there and they're trying to cast out some demons from somebody and said, we cast out this demon in the name of Paul who knows Jesus. And the demon says, well, I know who Paul is and I know who Jesus is, but I don't know you. And he beats these seven sons of Sceva to death and strips them and sends them outside naked and bleeding. Be careful. You don't do that stuff. It's not, it's not necessarily for us. So it was used by very few exercising demons. But something else we need to see here is we don't need to ignore the significance of a real exorcism, if you will. Because it's a demonstration of the permanent hostility between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of darkness. 1 John 3, 8 tells us that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he's here. And, you know, he, he didn't come, Jesus didn't come to merely wrestle with flesh and blood, but with the powers of darkness. And we're called to wrestle there with, as well. And we wrestle through the, through the Bible, through the scripture, and through prayer. Verse 16 begins by stating, he appointed twelve. And the word therefore appointed means to make or create something. It can mean to make or create. We can easily say that uh, Jesus didn't simply appoint 12 men to a task. Instead, he made them into something. He made them into something. And what did he make them into? I think he made them into the beginnings of the church, the very embryo of the church, if you will. The scriptures tell us that the church is founded upon the foundation of what? The apostles and the prophets. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus chose 12 disciples. He could have chose 8 or 10. He could have chose 20. But he chooses 12. How many tribes of Israel are there? 12 tribes of Israel. 12 apostles. There is a link, I think. There is a symmetry going on here between the church of the Old Testament and the church of the New Testament. Now, what was the purpose of Israel in the Old Testament? What did God tell them to do? He has a very specific task for them. Isaiah 43 is one of the passages that talks about it. The Lord is speaking and he says, You are my witnesses. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know me, that you may believe me, and understand that I am he. He says, before me uh, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed, when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. That's Israel's purpose. They are to be a light to the nations. They are to reach out to them. That is the calling of 
of God upon Israel. And Jesus, before he ascends in Acts 1.8, says this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then what does he say? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's the call. Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament, one and the same. The church of Jesus Christ is the new Israel. How else can you explain that, you know, all, every kindred and every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be there? It is that we are the new Israel. That's who the church is. We have the same mission. We have the same calling. We are God's witnesses. We are to be the light in the darkness. We're to spread the story of the gospel of God, the story of the gospel of salvation, so that blind eyes may be opened, so that prisoners may be set free from their sins. That is what we are called to do. And the best way to accomplish this, I think, is to follow the example of Christ himself. We find it in the passage. We'll have to backtrack a little bit to verse 14. It says that he appointed 12, we've already talked about this a little bit, to be with him. We've seen the need that, of us being with Jesus, but the other side of the verse is, is, you know, that Jesus needed to be with them. In his humanity, he needed fellowship. He needed to be with people. He needed to be with these men. And if Jesus needed such fellowship, how much more do you and I need fellowship. It's vital. It's vital that we worship together. It's vital that we study the Bible together, that we sit around a table in fellowship with one another because we are the church. We are the body of Christ. And a body cannot function if it's fragmented. You didn't leave the house this morning and say, oh, I think I'll leave my big toe at home. No, you didn't do that. You need your big toe or you'll fall over. Trust me, I know about these things. I know about falling over. And you didn't say, well, I think I'll leave my arm there. It's kind of tired. No, you need your whole body to function. It's only when we function as a whole that we fulfill the calling of Christ on our lives. And in the, li and in the life of the church. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let's consider how to do that, how to stir up one another to love and good works. And then he says, not neglecting to meet together. How can you stir somebody up to love and good works if they're not there? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of, a son, of some, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. And speaking of encouragement, there's only one final point and then we're done. Okay? One final point. Sometimes I think we look back at the church in the first century and we look at these disciples and we think, well, they, they did everything right. They've got it made. They, they, they knew what they were doing. Well, you know, just look at that list of names, verses 16 through 19. Just, just take a glance at it. You got, it starts off with Peter. What did he do? He denied Christ three times. And then you've got James and John, the sons of thunder. They go to this town. They're called that because they go to this town. People disagree with them. Lord, call down thunder and just barbecue the whole bunch of them. You know, strike lightning on them all. Well, this sounds real loving and forgiving, doesn't it? And it's, well, they got along together. Well, look at the polar opposites of there. Matthew, the tax collector, in agreement with the Roman government, collecting taxes for the Roman government. And then you have Simon the zealot. Zealots used to go out and ambush Roman soldiers and kill them. Polar opposites. Yet they come together through the grace of God and Jesus Christ. And they turn the world upside down. And we need to remember something else. You know, when Mark wrote this gospel, he could have left Judas' name out. You know, he wrote it some 20 some odd years after the fact. He could, you know, he could have redacted that. He could have edited that out, but he left it in, didn't he? Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And I think that's a wonderful reminder to us that the followers of Jesus aren't perfect and they don't have to be in order to fulfill the purposes and the call of Jesus Christ. That Jesus fulfills his purpose and his call in spite of our failure and I believe sometimes even perhaps through our failures.
Indeed, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, what happened? He inaugurates the new covenant. His betrayal leads to what? His death and his resurrection. His betrayal leads to our atonement. His betrayal leads to our salvation. God works in and through our imperfections. He works through them for our good and for his glory so that the message of the gospel might spread throughout the world. And that's why I think Jesus, knowing about our imperfections there in the Gospel of John, he says, if you by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How could that group of people love each other? Look at them. Look at them. Look at that ugly preacher that stands up there, and look at how ornery he is, but they love him anyway. That's got to be God. That's got to be God. That's why the love and grace and forgiveness is so vital and so important that the message may go forward, that all people will know that Jesus is Lord and that he is the Son of God. Gracious God, we thank you for these precious promises and these precious truths that are in your word. We thank you for your love to us. May we go from this place and spread that love and be a witness to all that we meet. In your name we pray. Amen.